To finish up the morning session, we're going to hear from our major sponsor from, where are they, up there, Southern Cross University. Lorraine Gordon is their representative. She's based at Southern Cross Uni. She's the energetic, very energetic conduit between industry research and community. She's the Director of Strategic Projects and Associate Director of the University's Centre for Organic Research. As well, she's the founder of the National Regenerative Agriculture Alliance, and she's overseen the very successful Farming Together program where we created land to market, so that was, uh, that was a big win, and helped more than 28,500 other farmers, fishers and foresters create projects and cooperatives. And she's also seeing her first batch of students through the reg new regenerative agriculture degree. Generally, she is a powerhouse, so please welcome Lorraine Gordon. Thank you, Rebecca. Now, uh, Tony said that I had, I think I started with 15 minutes to talk today, and that has been was re then reduced to 12.5 minutes. And now I know that I'm standing in front of morning tea and coffee, so I guess that means it's about five minutes. So I'm going to have to really cut to the chase and just, because I'm, I think I'm okay at that anyway, and uh, talk about what matters um, and really sharpen my pencil this morning. So good to be here, so good to be here in person, so good to cuddle you guys. I've got to say it. I know that we shouldn't do that, but oh boy, it's good to touch. Okay. <laughs> what Rebecca didn't mention is I'm actually a farmer. Um, that is my roots. That is what I'm really passionate about. This is my farm. And I guess uh, this is my utopia. What can I say? That was taken a couple of weeks ago. But the importance of this photo is in 2019, um, my farm got smashed by not one fire, but two. So the big Ebor fire um, hit me on one end and the uh, East Cat Eye fire on the other. So I think I'm operating now with about one boundary fence out of four. And uh, of course, the uh, fencing contractors rocked up last week in the middle of the floods to start, I've only been waiting for a couple of years for them, and the whole mountain now has collapsed, the Dorigo Mountain, we've had a landslide that's going to take five weeks to clean up, so I can't get any staff to the farm, and I can't get the contractors up there, so it's all fun. So what I've come to realise, just to calm myself, is that the problems, they never go away, they just get more complex. And as we get older, we just sort of take the hits and learn to deal with complex problems. So Tony asked me to talk about, in 12.5 uh, minutes, um, the pitfalls of carbon farming, the latest in regenerative ag research, and the latest in regenerative ag education. And now I've got five minutes and I've been talking about my farm. OK, here's the steps in carbon farming. I guess the point of this picture is there are a number of steps. Probably the most important one would be uh, to make sure that you register before you go down this path so you have choices because you can't do things retrospectively. So it's no point just building carbon in the soil if in three to five years' time you find out that you've done a fantastic job of that and then you think, oh, it would have been nice to sell that carbon on the open market or to a corporate or to the government, but now I can't. So my advice to you is to definitely register. And of course, it's not suitable for everyone. So you need to actually ascertain whether you, know, you are a suitable uh, person to go down this path. And uh, there are lots of different things to learn in the carbon farming space. Uh, the other one is you don't need to use an aggregator. Okay, we all think it's going to be this huge expense up front to do baselining and auditing and get consultants and everything else. Yes, but when you bring in that um, arbitrator in the middle or the one, the middle man or the middle woman, whoever it might be, and that does suit some people because it means usually you don't have any upfront costs. At the end, when you're really starting to make money from carbon, then you're sharing your profits. And those profits could be shared, you know, you could be losing up to 30% of your profits. So there are two directions to go. In my case, I actually went it alone. I actually paid the money up front. I'm still paying the money up front to do all the various processes as, as outlined here. 
uh, knowing that I don't have to share the profits at the end. And I'm prepared to be an early adopter and a risk taker in that space, but that's not for everyone. And I'm not knocking aggregators, because I know we have some exceptional ones in the room, but there are different ways you can go about carbon farming. The other thing I want to make a quick note about is you do not have to have a contract in place straight away, and I suggest you don't. Because carbon farming is only going in one direction, well carbon, sorry, and that is up, the price of carbon. So it would be silly to lock yourself into contracts now at $15, um, when in the future they could be $25, $30, and in Korea they're actually $40. So. Uh, you, don't, you can start carbon farming and you can register, but you don't need to lock yourself into that space of contracts. Look, let's not try and take this uh, into too carefully when we haven't had coffee, um, but basically this was an example that I did on my farm. I haven't got all my farm under uh, carbon farming, uh, but the potential is 400 hectares of it um, could produce a minimum of 49,600 ACUs. And if you don't know what ACUs are, um, I think we have, we're going to hear a lot more about that today and you'll find out about what all that means. Um, but basically, happy days, in three to five years' time, that could be 1.5 million. That's what I'm hoping, and that's based on 1%. Um, in my area, it's possible to probably hit around 3% increases in carbon. So that's the perfect picture, and it'll be lovely if that happens, but of course I've been arguing with the Emissions Reduction Fund because of this horrible clause around what constitutes forest. And forest land, um, unfortunately, can be two metre trees, etc. and let's face it, a lot of us graze in amongst our trees, and that is still producing soil carbon, that's still sequestering carbon. So this is a problem. And this is a problem that I hope that the ERF will address um, by the end of the year. So there's been lots of discussion around that because it does mean there's a lot of land that's actually not eligible, even though it is your grazing land that you're sequestering soil carbon on. So there's my tips. Um, baseline where you're at, register with the government. Carbon prices are only going up. Uh, this is the range um, that we're looking at. There are both government and corporate markets uh, so, you know, and the corporate markets at the moment, you know, they're outstripping, they're starting, and I think David's probably touched on this as well, that, you know, this is going to be a big area. The corporates often lead in these spaces. Uh, economics often gets us where we need to be. Um, as crazy as that sounds, it's usually what brings massive change quickly. And, uh, of course, undertaking regen practices um, will also increase your triple bottom line. So, even though you've got this cost of... Uh, having to do what you need to do to uh, be a carbon farmer, you're also increasing your productivity at the same time. And let's face it, that upfront cost, gee, we can spend that on fences and tractors and all sorts of things, fertiliser often, uh, when I think this is a lot more of a positive way to spend what little money we don't have. Um, so there you go, my carbon farming tips. Now, educational offerings. I'm not going to talk about all these wonderful things that we now have at Southern Cross University or the fact that it's the biggest ag course in the country, over 400 students, thank you very much, in Regen Ag, and it's a Bachelor of Science. And I have to acknowledge uh, my colleagues here today. We've got Cody, we've got a, a stand out there, and I do hope everybody does visit our stand. We've got Graham Lancaster, who heads up our um, EAL lab. Everybody knows about the EAL lab at Southern Cross University. He's also around, so please do make your self known to them. Another very exciting thing that I would like to mention today that probably most of you don't know, and I'd also like to mention I have my son, Ethan Gordon, here, who is uh, doing his PhD in regenerative discourse and narrative, which is a very interesting space. And he's actually on the um, board of the Institute of Ecological Agriculture, who has developed an accreditation system for practitioners, for consultants, for farmers, and for educators. So like the CPA of the accounting world, um, or the master builders of the building world, we are going to have an accreditation for our consultants and our farmers, a stamp to say that they get it, that they know what regenerative agriculture, 
is all about, that they know what practising holistically is all about. So we are going to put hundreds of these students out there. Our students will actually get that accreditation. They'll be tested. Um, they'll sit in front of a panel to make sure they have a deep understanding of what the, the studies they've just learnt. Uh, so this is huge. And the exciting thing is that it's going to be attached to our students, our farmers and our consultants through the Institute of Ecological Agriculture that we've been working with, our industry body. Okay, oh dear, okay, my PhD, longitudinal study looking at different grazing systems in northern New South Wales. Um, the interesting thing is it became a longitudinal study because I had to keep stopping the clock so I could work. Uh, but that was really good because 2016 was pre-drought, pre-climate change really starting to bite and pre-anybody talking about regenerative ag. I then went and interviewed that same cohort of farmers in 2020 and it was a very interesting story what that produced. So it was a triple bottom line approach. It looked at um, the economics, the environmental aspects and the social aspects of those farming systems. And uh, we've seen, the other thing I had to look at um, was the principles of Regen Ag. So we often say, what's the definition of Regen Ag? Everybody asks, what's the definition? Got to have a definition. Got to put it in a box. What is it? Is it this? Is it that? The definition's not important. What is really critical is the principles. So together with my son, with Ethan and his PhD, we actually did, I guess, a meta-analysis of Regen principles all around the world. We then brought those principles back to Australia, into an Australian context and tested that amongst farmers, amongst practitioners, regen people, wherever we could. And even today, I mean, this is actually in your program, but I would really welcome feedback on these principles. I would really welcome debate and discussion around these principles. There's a couple of principles in there that I think, I just want to very quickly mention, I know I'm in, standing in line of coffee, but being comfortable in ambiguity. That's a really important principle and it actually showed up some interesting stuff from my research. I think if we're going to talk about ambiguity and if we're going to be into transformative learning, continuous transformative learning, then it's very hard for us to then go and put in a box or draw a line or certify Regen. Because what we are, we're on this continuous cycle of improvement. We are on a continuous awareness. We are growing with ecology. We are part of ecology. There is no point in time where we ever get there. Whilst I showed you my picture of my utopian farm, I'm not there. I will never get there. None of us will ever get there. So to put us into that old paradigm of a box or say that we need to certify or put a label on this or put a label on that or call it something or draw a line in the sand is dangerous. I'm not saying it can't be done, but if you look at these principles, please do it in the context of what these principles mean. That we have to relish the unknown and go with it. We have to be part of that environment and that ecology. We have to embrace trans transformation and transformative learning and know that there's just so much we don't know and we'll never know and we'll never master. And so that black and white approach that we have seen in the past in organics, you know, this is in and that's out, doesn't necessarily fit regenerative. And it can actually be um, polarising. I think it's so important for us to bring all farmers on this journey. It can't be the regenerative farmers and the conventional farmers. We all have to walk the journey together. So I don't want to rule out anybody from taking that first step in a regenerative way. And I think that's important. If we are talking about things like certification, verification, whatever it might be, um, accreditation in our case, you know, let's keep it in context of these principles. So, very quickly, I'm going very quick. This is what we found in profitability. This is what the other scientists that are working in the same space as I am, looking at these triple bottom line outcomes, less overheads and variable costs. What was interesting 
my neighbour will always put on two and a half kilos um, on his cattle when I'm putting on two kilos. He will uh, run three times as many cattle as I'll ever run. He's a conventional farmer. I call him the urea king. Uh, he loves what he does. He changes that ryegrass pasture. As soon as a new species comes out of ryegrass, bang, he's spraying out that paddock and he's got it in. It's awesome to watch. And uh, he's going to outstrip me every good year with kilos of beef. But what was really interesting, over a four-year period of when two and a half of those years was horrendous drought, then it started to even out. And the yields over that four years became the same. I didn't have the big boom and bust. It was just constant. I still had grass in the paddocks. And you, can, you could drive around New South Wales at that time and you could tell who was a holistic manager and who wasn't very quickly just by looking over the fence. So that has shown up in my research. That has shown up in others' research as well, that over a longer term, you're going to get those uh, evened out yields. I'm getting hunted off the stage. You can get this technology that if you go over time, it actually gives you an electric shock. <laughs> That's what happened to me last time. So you haven't got it so tough. Um, <laughs> OK, I'm going to talk environmental outcomes. We all know what they are. Look at that, fantastic. And we can be carbon farmers. Um, I'm finishing. We're doing cover cropping, so multi-species cover cropping. We're actually doing it in Western Australia, Victoria and New South Wales, so we're triangulating the research um, in that space and a uh, very exciting area. And I've taken one of, my um, one of my very good scientists that is an expert agronomist in the field, doesn't necessarily believe in Regen Ag or anything holistic. Oh, what's that? But he loves multi-species pasture cropping and cover cropping. So I said, that's good enough. Just don't talk and just keep researching. <laughs> um, oh dear, I hope that doesn't get back. And the link between soil health, plant health, animal health, human health. Wow, this is, watch this space, because this is going to drive everything. And there's some massive international research about to hit the media about what this means. What this means for cancer, autism, fertility levels. There is a huge link. We all know that, but wait till the consumer finds out. Um, there's Graham Lancaster and I playing with our toys, so to speak, you know, our carbon, carbon tools. Very exciting stuff we're doing in the carbon space. So we're, we're actually working out, uh, we've got two major research projects to actually find out what builds carbon in the soil the quickest. Um, so, you know, we're trying all different types of um, processes as they apply to real farms, real carbon farmers that are actually doing the work. Uh, biochar, um, huge potential in the biochar industry. I won't go into that now. I'll get hunted off. Pesticides effects on microbial diversity. We all know what that means and it also how it affects our water, um, our water systems and uh, low-lying areas, it's pretty substantial. So doing a lot of work at the Marine Science Centre in that space. And I think I'm done. <laughs> now we can have coffee.